Welcome. We're here today with Professor Frank Towers of the University of Calgary. And Frank is the author of The Urban South and The Coming of the Civil War, and also the co-editor of a book called Confederate Cities, The Urban South During the Civil War Era. And we're going to talk about the city of New Orleans during the Civil War and the period in the run-up to the Civil War. So if we could sort of, I, I think what I'd like to do is, is sort of think about the 1850s, the coming of the war, and then sort of a bit about the war itself. So by the 1850s or so, how was New Orleans similar to other cities in the South and in the US, and in what ways was it distinctive from them? Well, New Orleans, as I think people in your class know, is, is a really unique city. In some ways, there's, you know, there's nothing like it in the rest of the US. So it's always going to have this sort of exceptional quality to it. Of course, I also think that gets widely exaggerated in the way that people talk about New Orleans, just because it's such a popular tourist destination. I mean, um, saying it's just like Columbus, Ohio would totally kill the whole, the whole vibe there. Um, but if we're in the 1850s, I mean, I think there's some things about New Orleans that are, that are typically Southern or typically part of what slave society cities look like. That's really what we're talking about here. And um, also very distinctive to its particular location at the mouth of the Mississippi with this history of two different imperial, really three different imperial regimes behind it and, and so on. So let's talk about what's similar and the big, you know, the way that I would look at this and the big backdrop. Um, to me, one of, the, one of the trends in American historiography, as we try not to be too long-winded here, that, that my own work has tried to combat is the notion of a very distinctive difference between the South and the North that's grounded in ideas about modernity. The South definitely is different. Slavery makes a difference. But the, the familiar view, one that lasted well into the late 20th century, uh, was that what slavery did to the South was make it a tradition-bound society, something um, famously in the words of Eugene Genovese, the closest thing America had to, uh, to, to feudalism, or words to that effect. And if that's what you think, if that's how you interpret the South, then you focus on the rural South, and you really play up um, the comparisons with the, with the North that show that the South is, um, is behind in levels of modernization. One of the key measurements often has been cities. Um, cities are the, are the sort of symbolic uh, manifestation of modernity. They've got large populations, capitalism, industry, cosmopolitan culture, um, rational government, all these things. And London and New York have, have stood over all the other cities in 19th century historiography as the, as the paragons. In the 21st century, as applied to urban history and almost every other field of social sciences, the the, the interpretive walls around that notion of modernity have just crumbled. Um, we owe that to many different influences, the postmodernists, the end of the Cold War, cultural anthropology, um, diversity in the, you name it. We're able to see much better now um, in 2020 that there are manifestations of what we would call modernity uh, in places that don't end up as the winners of that race. And this would be the slave South and the Confederacy. They are very much participants in the global economy. Um, there's been a lot of work on the role of slavery as sort of the spearhead of capitalism in some ways. Um, and certainly New Orleans and the slave trade are, are crucial to uh, the takeoff of American capitalism. And they're deeply embedded in the institution of slavery. So to say that it's not part of the modern world is, is comforting because that means we, we may not have it again. More disturbing is to say, well, it, its institutions were, were very much part of the whole process of making modern America. It's just that the particular vision of how slavery would go forward failed. So what's that, this make New Orleans like in the 1850s? It makes it a rapidly growing, modernizing, and by modernizing, I mean engaged in global commerce, uh, increasingly diverse in its population, cosmopolitan culture, um, a sense of trying to be up with the times, committed to the present, all those things are in New Orleans but they look different than they would in Western Europe or the Northeastern United States. The principal ways they look different are, New Orleans does not have much manufacturing. In fact, it's different than other slave state cities like Baltimore or Richmond in that regard. Commerce out of the docks is so big, so important that you see a, a much larger population of, of working class New Orleanians who do um, 
who do manual labor on the docks, cargo handling, hauling, carting, and then small shops, commerce, moving stuff around. It's, it's fascinating if you get into the New Orleans um, occupational census records. I don't, I don't think there's any place like that in the States that has that many people engaged in casual manual labor um, through the port. On that port, you've got this fascinating mix of people. New Orleans is in some ways the most cosmopolitan city in America because it's got such a bigger African descended presence. That African descended presence is about half of it is enslaved, roughly about 12% of the total city. Another half is free. Free African Americans live under a whole bunch of white supremacist constraints, so their freedom is very different from the large number of German and Irish newcomers who are there. Um, there are a lot of Northerners in New Orleans as well. Some recent studies have shown that you know in the urban South, a small number of the people there are from the rural South. Most of them are from other cities, from the North, from Europe, from, uh, from you name it. So if you go to New Orleans in the 1850s, you're going to hear several different languages being spoken. You're going to see all different kinds of people. There's going to be a kind of you know, intoxicating air of freedom and liberty and diversity there um, that's, that's got this other layer of suffocation around it of white supremacy and slavery. So that makes New Orleans really different from let's say New York City, but then if we went along the Gulf Coast to Mobile, um, to um, try to think of other cities on the Gulf Coast besides, well, let's call Mobile, Alabama, then we go around to Savannah, Charleston, up the coast to Norfolk, there are gonna be a lot of similarities. Uh, a working class that's divided between black and white, between free and slave, large numbers of non-enslaved African-Americans um, who again, live under these constraints. Some of them have risen to positions of prominence like the Yen de Color in uh, New Orleans, who I'm, I'm sure you guys are talking about in the course, um, and yet others who, who aren't. Um, and that makes for just a, you know, a unique mix that's common to cities in slavery. If we went down to Cuba, we'd see Havana looking a lot like New Orleans, for example, or um, if we went into some of the ports in the Caribbean. Anyway, I've gone on way too long on that. I'll knock it off there. Great. Um, that, that gives us a good sense. And I, I was also sort of struck by um, your comment there and also in the, the essay that, that you wrote in Aaron Sheehan Dean's collection about sort of the way that, that, thank you, Bruce. <laughs> that, that we're not, um, you know, we're not thinking about sort of binaries as much as we once did. You know, we used to think of freedom and slavery were totally separate things. And same thing with urban and rural. And th there were many different kinds of urban space and, and different ways of, of defining that. Um, so if, if, we think, if we think about the sort of the political developments that in the 1850s that we're all familiar with in the fallout from the Mexican-American War that eventually lead to the American Civil War, uh, what role does New Orleans play in the politics of the coming of the Civil War? And also, how does the, the sort of national level political events that eventually lead to the Civil War, how do those play out and affect New Orleans? That's a, that's a great question. And my tendency is to give a three hour answer here. So I'll try to keep it <laughs> short. Um, New Orleans, you know, New Orleans is, is critical in the, what we might call the pro-slavery imperialism that's, that's underway in the antebellum era. Um, the, the uh, enslavers who, uh, you know, the people who own, who have lots of capital tied up in, in uh, slave, slave labor, um, very much have their eyes on expanding the institution. And Cuba has long been one of their prizes. Um, they're also, um, you know, curious about other opportunities in the Gulf. Um, and New Orleans is the staging ground for, um, for mobilization for the war with Mexico in the 1840s. It's, um, it's sort of the, you know, the launching pad for what we might call slavery's, slavery's imperial frontier. So we can see, um, you know, Narciso Lopez, who is a Cuban revolutionary, organizes his attempt to invade Cuba in the early 50s out of New Orleans. He gets support from prominent um, slaveholders and bankers in, in the city, as well as Mississippi right next door. Um, there's lots of interesting global connections, or at least, um, you know, North American connections out of New Orleans and the expansion of slavery. And some of the um, sort of ardent pro-slavery expansionists, particularly Pierre Soule, and I'm, I'm really, no, not Soule, I'm thinking of John Slidell, who's an ally of James Buchanan. He's from, he's from Louisiana. His, his sort of base is there in the city. So 
at the, at the highest levels of um, Southern pro-slavery expansionist politics, New Orleans is one of the centers. James um, D.B. DeBow is, uh, operates out of there and his um, DeBow's review is a sort of mouthpiece for this point of view. What else does it have to do with the coming of the Civil War? Well, I think that's one story. And you know, if I were to compare it to today's politics in the States, it's like the fact that Fox News, Rudy Giuliani, and so many of Trump's most fanatical proponents live in New York City which hates Trump overall. Um, it's got a base of people who are there, but really their constituency is out in you know, red America. New Orleans is kind of like that because the, the larger population of the city is not nearly as invested in slavery as that, as that elite is. Um, I mentioned all those uh, Irish and Germans who are coming there. New Orleans has a very large white working class. <clears throat> They're mostly people who have shown up there not for reasons of ideology and revolution, the, the 1848 radicals that come out of Europe, they end up in places like St. Louis where they do really get involved in politics, but most of the folks who go to New Orleans are the poorest of the immigrants, which is an interesting story about the, um, the bargain rates on getting return passage on cotton cargo ships to Southern ports. There's a lot more interest in going to New York or a free state because for obvious reasons, your job prospects are better when you're not competing with enslaved labor. So the people who end up in places like New Orleans and deep south ports are the ones who are trying to scrape the, you know, scrape the cheapest fare they can. And when they get there, they're really looking for whatever they can get. Um, nonetheless, with that large number of recent arrivals who are manual laborers who have no chance, no interest in becoming slaveholders, maybe they do, but they're possibilities a long way off. Um, they forge a kind of politics that are not aligned with that of the pro-slavery expansionists. You know, what they want isn't so much abolition. They're mostly racists and it's pretty hard to, to find um, a lot of abolitionist heroes in the 1850s white working class in the urban South, but they're not pro-planters. That is what they want is a, is a government that's responsive to the needs of the masses. And that government does things like cleans the sewers, um, builds the roads, uh, improves the harbor, uh, has schools. It does all sorts of good government reforms. And the vehicle for this stuff, weirdly, very strangely, in a place like New Orleans, is the Know Nothing Party, an anti-immigrant party that weirdly attracts a little bit of support from some of these folks, especially Catholics. Uh, I'm sorry, um, especially German, German Protestants, not Catholics, although New Orleans has its own odd number of Catholic Know Nothings that's for my hour long version, we'll leave them aside. The know nothings come into these cities and tap into the, the desire for um, a more responsive government that, that deals with the masses of white working class voters. And in New Orleans, the know nothings last into the Civil War. Um, they're at odds with the planters. And in the late 1850s, you see New Orleans having street wars um, between uh, people like PGT Beauregard, who becomes a Confederate general. He's a customs appointee in New Orleans who leads a, a group that calls itself the Vigilance Committee to try to overthrow the Know Nothings because he and his allies are worried that the Know Nothings are, are sort of out of the control of the, of, of, um, the pro-slavery consensus. And in fact, one of the things the Know Nothings use to attack Beauregard is that as a federal customs appointee, he is using slave labor on, uh, on repair projects on the New Orleans levee. And he says, look, we're, you, white workers can't get a break because they're competing with this guy. So the Know Nothing sort of launch a, you know, a divisive ethnic and class-based battle to mobilize the free white working class of these cities behind, um, behind something that looks a little bit like good government. It doesn't align well with our 20th century politics. Um, one other part of what they want to do, though, is they really think the federal government has a role to play here. They see the union as important. They don't favor disunion. And they become a, one of those bases for dissent within the South when secession happens. So even though New Orleans is at, at, at one time, you know, the place where um, all the fanatics and the money run through for, for pro-slavery expansionism, it also has within its municipal politics the seeds of the, seeds of the undoing of the homegrown uh, pro-slavery Democratic Party in the South. And, and pro-slavery Democrats are very much aware of this in places like New Orleans, Baltimore, Richmond, and so forth, and ally with local conservatives to try to put these folks down. Well, politics in, in New Orleans is, is never uninteresting or simple. No. Um, so to come back to the planters, if, if I remember correctly, aren't a lot of the sugar planters in, in South Louisiana Whigs as well, yeah. which they're very much in favor of slavery, but they're slightly at odds with some of the national policies of the Democrats, which is the natural home 
for most slave owners. Well, this, thank right? you, Bruce. This is part of my three hour answer to that question. Let's talk about Charles E.A. Guyeret. I'm mispronouncing his name. Um, he is a French Catholic know nothing from one of those wig planter families. He is in New Orleans, but as you know, the, the, the sugar bowl is very close to the city. A lot of planters live in New Orleans um, or have houses there. They're closely connected. And you're absolutely right that the, the wigs of the, um, uh, you know, the, who are the wigs? Uh, the, the wigs were a party that dies in the early 1850s. The key thing if you're a sugar planter is, sugar is not competitive on a global market. Cuban sugar is cheaper. What they want are tariffs to protect sugar. So they've always been in favor of the, the, the nationalist parties that want to, so to go back to Hamilton, that want a federal government that will protect American industries, including sugar. There's an economic incentive for that, but there's also something else in the water, you know, so the way these folks think, it's a group of them around Natchez as well, um, that, you know, that really thinks that a strong federal government and the stronger institutions will be, they'll, they'll be better off there. Um, they're going to protect things like property and capital. Um, the larger economic vision of those quig planners is for something that has a lot of railroads, national coordination. It's not that Democrats don't want that stuff, but Whigs have a different way to get there. And they're, they're also a little bit uncomfortable with the, just the, you know, the, the rowdy populist culture of the democracy of the Democrats who are, you know, famously Andrew Jackson has a, has a raging uh, boozy party for his inauguration that really just offends everybody's sensibilities. Democrats are always, kind of in your face, the, the Whigs who these folks came out of were much more refined. By the 1850s, things are, that strain of conservatism is still there. And there's been some really good work lately by, um, by folks in the UK, Adam Smith, um, down in Oxford right now, a wonderful book about the North and conservatism. Um, and this sort of mindset, it's not like today's right-wing conservatives, but rather people who are moderates in their culture and ambitions and way of thinking about politics. It's there across the country. And so, New Orleans has a lot of wealthy planters who favor that. Back to this guy, Guy Ray. He's Catholic. He's descended from the French Catholic elite. He's a know-nothing. The know-nothings allegedly hate Catholics, but in, but in Louisiana, they have support from them because the know-nothings line up with that conservative Whig tradition. It's a very uneasy alliance because the know-nothings in New Orleans also have, you know, uh, rowdy street gang guys who serve as police officers, just like they do in other cities but they nonetheless are able to sort of forge an alliance of top and bottom to, to hold things together. That, that guy inadvertently mentioned before, Pierre Soule, he is a Democrat, but he ends up aligned with this strand of conservative unionism and the know-nothings. And um, it makes, it, as you said, trying to sort out Louisiana politics is, is really frustrating. You may remember the historian, Ted Tunnell. I think he's still around, but he wrote a lot about reconstruction in Orleans. And one of his books starts out by saying, I want to explain, um, Louisiana politics during Reconstruction, and it's impossible that there's so many factions and sides that keeping them straight is, is tough. So that, I agree with you, that line is present. Um, you know, their, their larger opponents in the world of the, of the enslaving elite are the cotton planters who have a very different political economy. Starting named Brian Shane's done very good work on sort of thinking about the cotton planters globally. They don't need the federal government. Um, they've been Democrats all their lives. A lot of them are more, you know, sort of William Sutpen style new newcomers, thinking of Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom to the South. And, um, and they're not that crazy about the, about the city and it's, it's snobby elitists either. Anyway, there's my answer to, to who those folks were. Oh, that's great, that's great. If, if we uh, sort of switch gears or, or sort of move ahead a bit to the Civil War itself, um, I wonder, thinking about the, the sort of uh, capture of, of New Orleans and by the Union and the, the fairly extended occupation um, by the Union Army of New Orleans and, and that southern bit of Louisiana uh, through you know, most, of, most of the war, how does the experience of New Orleans compare to other Confederate cities? Because yeah. it, it strikes me that a lot of the cities don't really experience a long occupation like that. It's a great, it's a great question. I mean, um, there's been a lot of great work on Civil War in New Orleans um, since I was really reading closely in the field. Uh, just a great short book, if anybody's interested, Mutiny at Fort Jackson by Michael Pearson. Wonderful study of, of, the, of how the Union captures the place. Um, maybe we start there. Because one of the things Pearson finds is that 
the, there are two forts below New Orleans that are supposed to protect it from naval invasion. They fall almost immediately. And, they've, and they fall because they're staffed by, uh, by conscripted immigrant militia who, who don't want to be there. The, most, of the, most of the gung-ho young men who want to be Confederates have, have joined, the, joined the big army. And they're in Virginia or they're up in um, Shiloh and Corinth. Um, they're not doing home guard duty. And, you know, that's for losers in their mind. So at the last minute, Lovell, the general, command of the city, scrounges up some home guard from people who would rather be doing something else. They see a, a surprise massive Union flotilla and like, we're out of here. And the city falls in short order. Um, 18, April 1862, it's a huge blow to the Confederacy. It's its largest city. It has a lot of its banking capital. Um, it's prestigious. Uh, it's just, you know, arguably it's one of the most important um, early uh, winds of the war for the Union. Um, not, no, it was the most important. It makes the Western theater very different from the Eastern theater. What happens in the city? Um, you know, I would, I would say New Orleans isn't the only place to have the early occupation. We could also look at Tennessee, at Memphis and Nashville. They fall pretty early to the Union. In fact, a lot of the major urban centers of the Confederacy are out of their control early in the war. If we think of the slave states going all the way to the Ohio River, you know, Baltimore, St. Louis, New Orleans, and Louisville were places that they desperately could have used. So by the time New Orleans falls, there are no cities over, over 100,000 left in the Confederacy. <coughs> Some of them kind of bulge up because of refugees. Richmond gets to about 150 for a couple minutes in the middle of the war. <coughs> but there's nothing like that agglomeration of capital, labor, um, transportation infrastructure that New Orleans provided. So it's a big blow. And in the city, <coughs> excuse me, I think you see a process that happens later in some of the other confederacies. And this is the union occupation creating an opening for those 1850s pro-union, largely working class political movements to flourish. New Orleans is the best example. Um, for years, people have hated Benjamin Butler. Uh, your courses, students know about him yet or Beast Butler, yeah. Yeah. Benjamin Butler, the scourge of New Orleans. He's the Union commander in charge. And he gets a bad reputation because he's pretty rough on Confederates. That is, he, he, um, he arrests them. He stops public displays by Confederates. His famous woman order <coughs> offends the honor of, you know, refined white women by saying, by treating them as um, basically as ladies of the evening or as prostitutes if they insult Union soldiers. Um, all those things are part of the horrible legend of Ben Butler and his brother, was probably a corrupt cotton trader, and so that didn't help either. And he wasn't handsome. Those are all things that count against him. What Butler does do in New Orleans is build up a free state political party. Um, he performs that municipal infrastructure work that the know-nothings would talk about, but one thing Butler does that's very smart is simply hire a lot of unemployed men who might otherwise end up in Confederate militias cleaning the streets. And New Orleans finally smells good um, during, the, during the war. It's you know, it's low land and it's a 19th century city, so it's got a lot of pestilence around. Um, deals with yellow fever, deals with, uh, deals with unemployment, um, encourages the mobilization of the Free State Party that becomes the basis for the pro-union statehood movement in Louisiana. One thing that Butler isn't so great at is um, civil rights for African Americans. He's much better than others. I mean, Butler, in fact, is the person who begins the, the contraband policy of saying he's not going to return uh, escaped slaves to their masters. He does that in Virginia, not in New Orleans. Um, but he still doesn't go, you know, all the way in what the free people of color want, and that is full civil political equality. That struggle, though, does get underway under that Union occupying regime. It does create space for non-enslaved African Americans very early on there to push for to push for civil rights. A good example of this is Louisiana Native Guard. I don't know if this is going to come up in your class. Fascinating group of people. These are um, people of mixed African European ancestry who are mostly from property owning families. Some of them slave owning families that form a volunteer militia that wants to serve for the Confederacy. Confederates are so worried about having black people under arms that they refuse to arm them. They let them march around, but that's it. Um, immediately after Union occupation, they say, we're for you, we're for the Union. They switch sides, they get armed. And that's one of the few um, African-American units in the US Army that has black officers in it. Famously, one of the people in that unit is PBS Pinchback, the future governor of Reconstruction New Orleans. So in the Civil War, 
the, the possibilities of a reconstruction that really looks robust, that really looks like something that's gonna bring a version of a true free labor, um, not anti-racist, we can't go that far, but at least um, equality before the law society has its chrysalis there. Um, it's a stretch to say that, that Memphis and, and um, uh, Nashville go as far as that, but versions of this are happening across the urban South because those cities are the places where you're gonna see the most people who have never really been under the rule of the of the rural planners? They've had the they've had the most distance from that place. They've got the the political base both in the free African American community, and in the white free labor community. And they've got the most connections because they're cities and they're well networked into the rest of the world, to be reinforced, if you will, by newcomers from the north who support their aspirations. After the war is a different story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, after the war, I I suppose one of the things that happens, kind of during the war that begins to shape things after the war is about, I think it's about 30,000 African Americans come in from the countryside to the city. And what you were saying about the Irish and German laborers who effectively controlled the docks um, before, they lose control of, of the docks and it's predominantly these, these new African Americans. And, and it's interesting the the dynamic there between these you know, rural people who had been enslaved coming into a city um, and the, the sort of political environment and the, the complex network of structures that you were talking about. Um, well, that, I mean, and that's really, I mean, that's a fascinating part of, of the thing on, on several levels. Um, so after the war, and I'm starting to, you know, my expertise fades once we get, once we get too, too far in the late 19th century. Um, you, you see those, you see those white, workers come back in, in very racist movements to try to purge black labor from the docks. Um, the National Labor Union gets, gets its start there. I am just blank, and it's, it's not William Silvis, it's another leader, it's William Trevelin, Trevelin um, who is a late 19th century union organizer. And he starts out as a dock, as a uh, artisan on the New Orleans docks and gets run out of town for being a unionist in 1861, heads north. Um, kind of, and he has a great thing in his autobiography, just a couple of pages of trying to escape New Orleans under the pressure of secession coercion. Um, and you know, sadly, very tragically, those folks come back and and are in favor of a whites only um, labor movement, and it um, it's it's a missed opportunity there. There's also you know the influx of of refugees. Um, uh, Michael Fitzgerald wrote a great book about this for Mobile, close by, and uh, Eric Arneson and others have written about this in New Orleans. Um, there's tension between, um, you know, people who were enslaved until they got to the city and the, and the free black elite in, this, in, in, uh, in New Orleans and Mobile and other places as well. And so there are lots of potential rifts for solidarity there that, that, are, that are easily exploited. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, you know, if we look at that post-war situation across the urban south, I'll just throw this in because we're thinking about it, the demography of these places really changes. In the 1850s, the African-American population of southern cities has been declining. It's been declining in part because enslaved people are being sold off to the very lucrative market um, in, in the Cotton Belt, and also because of the massive influx of Europeans. It's in the 1840s and 50s, after the cotton famine economic crisis in Germany, that this big influx comes in. And they, they, they crowd southern ports, upping the white population, lowering percentage of African-Americans. That's, that flips in the war. Um, no one wants to migrate to the to the Confederate South. I mean, it's hard to do anyway. So the, the newcomers are all Southerners now, uh, black and white. But when the war ends, a lot of whites who refugee to cities go back to the countryside, but a lot of blacks stay there. And so you can see the African-American proportion of Southern cities increase dramatically. You can see that, and by the same token, you see the Southern born population, the number of people who, who are native to the rural South, dramatically increase. And so that, you know, that when I was talking earlier about the image of the South as predominantly rural, traditional, homogenous, it's more like that after the Civil War than before. There's more of these folks uh, who are urbanites who come from the rural South, bring its folkways with them. Well, that, that brings us into the Reconstruction period. And I think that makes a, a pretty good point to sort of bring this conversation to a close. And we'll talk about Reconstruction in some other lectures and other conversations because Reconstruction and the politics and so forth of what's happening in New Orleans is extremely complicated in slightly different ways than what we've heard. Uh, but I just wanted to say thanks to Frank for joining us today. 
and wish everyone all the best for the fall semester. Well, thank you, Bruce. And I hope that um, students get some value out of this and it's, it's been a lot of fun. So I appreciate it.